This is a nightmare scenario for the cops. Yes, ladies, that really was a gun in his pocket. I don't know the man. I do admire the generation he was part of. Mongols back in the news. This is a nightmare scenario for the cops. A bikey shooting in broad daylight, which ends with an ordinary citizen having his Toyota carjacked. Have a look at this. East Perth looking like Kabul Airport. The good news is it's not the start of a bikey war. It's an internal feud involving just one gang, the Mongols. One wannabe member had a falling out with a patched member, allegedly. It seems to be contained, but the cops are all over it because they're very worried about the power of the Mongols Nation Outlaw Motorcycle Club, which is its official name. It's the fastest growing bikey gang in the world, and it's got the godfather of the contemporary West Australian underworld as its poster boy. The Mongols seem to come from nowhere. They came on the scene in WA last year when McCanty became a member. The club itself is quite old, traces its roots back to the Vietnam War. Quite a few veterans who came back to the US after their tours didn't get welcomed home as heroes. They were called baby killers and other such things, and many sought support as members of bikey gangs, including the Hells Angels Club. At the time, the Hells Angels had a whites-only policy. A group of Hispanic veterans who were denied membership started a rival gang. They named it the Mongols, in honour of Genghis Khan, and inked a constitution that made it illegal to discriminate on grounds of race, which was all very woke. You'll see a lot of non-white members of the Mongols, including this impressively large fellow at the front of this photo. That's Clovis Chikonga. He's got a rap sheet that includes taking a firearm into the Dolls House strip club. Yes, ladies, that really was a gun in his pocket. Allegedly. This shooting isn't really great timing for Troy McCanty. McCanty would be fuming about this because it happened 48 hours before his father's funeral. Michael McCanty died on September the 17th. A mass is being held at St Mary's Cathedral on Wednesday afternoon. Troy hates the fact his bikey lifestyle has overshadowed his father's passing, which is justified because Michael McCanty deserves to be remembered for the person he was rather than for the exploits of his sons. St Mary's Cathedral is a big place. It's going to be packed and it won't be bikies. People think it'll be like a funeral from the Sopranos or Goodfellas. It won't. St Mary's will be full of ordinary West Australians who are there to pay their respects to Michael and give their condolences to his wife, Yvonne. Because this couple, by all accounts, were completely normal, pleasant, caring, hard-working people. The most unlikely couple to be embroiled in newspaper headlines so regularly. You just had to look at the bereavement notices in the West in the days after he passed away to appreciate how well he was regarded. Sounds as though you really admire the man. I don't know the man. I do admire the generation he was part of, though. It's impossible to believe now, but there was a time in West Australian history when the name McCanty was synonymous with something other than police raids and Harley Davidsons. In the 1960s, 70s, 80s, even into the 1990s, if you heard the name McCanty, you thought of shoes. Mm -hmm. Michael was a cobbler, probably the best cobbler in Australia. He came to the country in 1950 from Italy. He was only a teenager. I think he was 17. He was part of that generation of Italians who came after the war and worked their asses off to build new lives. He met Yvonne and they later married. It was a good match because Yvonne had some business now. They opened their first shoe repair store in Dianella in the 1960s, worked their guts out. In between growing their business, which you will know as Mike's multi-tool service, they grew their family. They had four children, all boys. James was the eldest, then Troy, Jason and youngest brother Tyrone. The kids all turned out to be quite talented at what they did in very different ways. We all know Troy, football tragic, bumbag enthusiast and of course ice cream connoisseur. That's not how you hold an ice cream. You think you're the only person to tell me that. Troy's been in and out of the headlines for decades. He first appeared in the West Australian in 1993. Nobody knew him back then. Reporters referred to him as Troy Desmond McCanty because there was another Troy McCanty in WA and we didn't want to get them mixed up. Now he's so well known he can get away with just one name, like Brittany or Adolf. He's been in the news as a coffin cheater, a fink and a mongol. I don't know how there's any skin left to tat. I don't know how he's still alive. He's been bombed, stabbed, beaten and shot at. And he's still standing. 
He's not the only McCandy boy who's been forced to face his own mortality. Older brother James, who we all know is Slim Jim from Slim Jim and the Fats, had a recent cancer scare on his tonsils. Any type of cancer is horrible, of course, but when you're an entertainer, it's especially bad to have something go wrong in your throat. He seems to have dodged a bullet there, though. Jason McCanty is the second youngest of the family. For a period there, Jason followed Troy's descent into the underworld. In 2005, he was charged with lying to the Australian Crime Commission, which seemed to be using Jason to go after Troy. Surveillance officers from the ACC followed Jason on flights around Australia, and they were convinced he was a money courier. This was all happening when Troy was facing charges over that dust-up at Metro City nightclub, which saw Scorpion Boy in a build a bag use a filleting knife to flay Troy wide open. That ended with Troy shooting to bag five times before being helped away by John Kizon and nearly dying from blood loss. Just another night out in Northbridge. Jason eventually went to jail for eight months for lying to the ACC and he's been pretty quiet ever since. And then there's Tyrone. This is where the Michael McCanty funeral will get a little bit awkward. Tyrone was at the centre of a major falling out in the family that went all the way to the high court. It started at a Christmas event in 2006 when Troy punched his partner, Tammy. It was horrific and it tore the family apart. Six years later, that assault was the subject of a trial which saw Troy spend seven years in jail and Tammy and their two boys put in witness protection. By the time everyone was in court, the McCanty family shoe business was a serious operation. Not just Mike's multi-tools. It had an import-export arm, a warehouse in Adelaide, I think it was, turnover of $5 million a year. Its wholesale and retail arms were run under two separate family trusts, which Tyrone had been in charge of since 2004. He had a falling out with his father, and in 2015, Michael and Yvonne went to the High Court to get back control of the trusts. Tyrone retained the retail operation and the parents got the wholesale arm. That didn't stem the bad blood though because the wholesale business went under in 2017, owing millions. Things got worse. Months later, Michael is left paralyzed by surgery to remove a brain tumor. That left him in a wheelchair. And in 2018, Jamie launches a crowdfunding campaign to help pay his parents $120,000 legal bill from the high court actions. In May, Michael and Yvonne back in the Supreme Court suing Westpac for allowing third parties to withdraw a heap of money from their personal accounts. How much? $3,719,261.63. That's a lot of shoes. Do you think there'll be trouble at the funeral? No. I think they'll show their father the respect he deserves, as we should, because you don't visit the sins of the sons upon the father and because they don't make them like Michael McCanty anymore. I'm Ben Harvey. For more Up Late, click the subscribe button below.